like to thank the organizers. So, um, in case you didn't hear, I'm the uh, team leader of Lunar Numbat, and we'll get to that later. However, firstly, you should be dead. Everyone in this room should be dead. Everyone in this city, everyone in the world, everyone who ever was or will be should not be. And this would have been the case if the astronomical norm for complex life in our solar system was also the case here on Earth. You see, of all the planets, moons and asteroids in our solar system, Earth is the only one known to have life, complex life. Now, I'm glad that you're not dead, and that's good, although the feeling may not be mutual at the moment, but let's have a glimpse at the neighbours. Here's Venus and Mars. Venus once had liquid water oceans, like us, but now it's a pressure cooker of a planet. It's intensely hot, it rains acid, it has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse system out of control. It's significantly lacking in complex life. And then, of course, there's us in the middle, Earth. I mean, we've got it all. We've got ants, we've got sequoias, we've got dolphins, we've got yellow-footed wallabies, we've got blueberries, we've got... I didn't say blackberries. We've even got Bert Newton. <laughs> We've got the lot. And then there's Mars. Mars also shows evidence of once having had liquid water oceans, but has since lost them. And it's barren and cold. Much of its atmosphere has been stripped off due to its diminished magnetosphere, and what's left is thin and unfriendly. It is, unfortunately, devoid of complex life. Earth is only one of eight planets... And it's clearly the odd one out when it comes to complex life. The quick numbers say that life on a planet in our astronomical backyard is unusual. But what about that newly discovered planet mentioned in the media that's supposed to have life on it, right? It's talked about a lot. It's called Gliese 581g. And for starters, its existence is disputed by scientists in Europe. But more importantly, at 20 and a half light years away, it's simply too far out of our reach. It is close enough, however, for an exchange of pleasantries over radio communications. But SETI, the ongoing search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has scanned the area twice in the past and heard not so much as a bleep from them, which is a shame. No radio commun communications from Gliese 581G, well, what makes that relevant? I mean, they could at least tell us they're not that keen on our reality TV, but... <laughs> Nothing from them. But back in the 1950s, Enrico Fermi, while working with a rather bright bunch of colleagues, had a casual conversation walking to lunch with them, which hopefully we'll be doing shortly. The gist of it was, if technologically advanced extraterrestrial civilizations exist, where is everybody? Bear in mind, this is a third-generation star that we live around. Fermi concluded that Earth should have been visited long ago and many times over. This conundrum became known as the Fermi Paradox. And it led to a more thorough analysis of the problem in the Drake Equation in 1961. The Drake Equation is a scientific approach to estimate the number of detectable extraterrestrial civilizations in our galaxy. <clears throat> the answer derived from this equation based on current scientific data is 2.31. That is to say that in our galaxy of 200 billion stars, the calculated instances of civilizations able to communicate that are currently still alive is 2.31. Now, there are two philosophies passionately argued and defended regarding life in the cosmos. The mediocrity principle, that there is nothing special about humans or the Earth, that life like us is common in the cosmos, and the rare earth hypothesis, that the emergence of complex life on Earth required an improbable combination of astrophysical and geological events and circumstances, and that humans and life on Earth are very special. Now, frankly, my feelings on the matter are enough postulating. Let's go find some life that's not of Earth and do the science already. I mean, talk is cheap. 
two moons in our solar system not too far away, Europa of Jupiter and Enceladus of Saturn, have liquid water oceans hidden under ice. Both seem likely to have some kind of life on them. We won't know until we go. Enceladus is shooting geysers of water out, out into space, and it appears to have some organic material in it. It's astronom in astronomical terms, it's waving its arms and yelling out, hey, look at me, I got it. <laughs> Both of these moons should be a high priority for exploration. We need to discover and understand any life that's on them before we can fully understand the origin of life at all. This simply cannot be done without space science. But space science has not developed as well as it could have by now. 1969, as was alluded to earlier, was the year Apollo 11 placed men on the moon. But it also is the year the internet was born. And Steve, of course. Today, billions of people have net access. I mean, half a year are on it at the moment, including smartphones and Quite a lot of people do their social networking, shopping, banking, game playing, twittering, everything on it daily. But space science is far less ubiquitous. People just don't know how to have access to it. They can't interact with it. They cannot develop it. In some regards, space science has regressed since 1969. The rocket Russia currently use to take people to the International Space Station is still based on the rocket that put the first man into space in 1961. Moreover, the space shuttle is about to be retired, and the US, without a replacement for it, is going to need to depend on those classic Russian rockets to get their people to the International Space Station. The internet got to where it is today by the adoption of open standards, risk-taking, and open-source software. Open source technologies, not just software. Space science today is risk adverse, often closed, and it uses proprietary systems. But it's also misunderstood. The media frequently, bless them, refers to space science related endeavours as the space race. Well, I mean, this rhymes nicely, but it's woefully inaccurate. The intense days of Cold War rivalry between the USSR and the US are long gone. And I mean, you know, all this stuff about using the first rocket that put the man into space to just, you know, get people up to the International Space Station. It's not a race. Others like to describe space as the final frontier. Well, I guess we've got Gene Roddenberry of Star Trek to thank for that. But this is also missing the personal reality of space science and space, the context is wrong. So let me put it to you like this. You are on a rock that's floating in space. Earth is a rock, and space is all around you, and you cannot escape it. You are completely dependent on things from space daily for life, and you are totally vulnerable to things from space that will take life away. The only time you ever left space was in your mind. The Google Lunar X Prize is a space exploration competition organized by the X Prize Foundation and funded by Google. This competition can help remedy the stagnation of space science development. It aims to encourage revolution through competition. The Google Lunar X Prize offers $20 million prize money to the first privately funded space flight team to land a rover safely on the surface of the moon, to travel half a kilometre, and send back high-definition video and still images. And there are some bonus prizes as well. The Ansari X Prize, also organised by the X Prize Foundation, was for a privately funded team to build a spacecraft capable of carrying three people into space twice within two weeks. And this was won by Scale Composites. Their innovative reusable manned spacecraft became the foundation for vehicles used by Virgin Galactic, which is set to start taking paying passengers into space next year. Prior to Charles Lindbergh flying nonstop across the Atlantic to win the Orteg Prize in 1927, 
People didn't think it was possible. Now commercial airliners take, you know, flying across any ocean for granted. Part of the reason why the Google Lunar X Prize exists is to dispel the notion that private space exploration is impossible. It's actually a lot more affordable than you might conceive of. But why the moon? Well, firstly, it's not that far away. My Subaru wagon has done more Ks than is the distance from the Earth to the moon. <laughs> it's a trusty old beast. But it's very important to understand the moon scientifically. When you learn about the moon, you learn about Earth. We know the moon was formed from a planetary collision of the young Earth with a Mars-sized object. And this certainly gave the Earth's innards something to think about. But it also led to the convection currents that generate the magnetosphere. The Earth's magnetosphere, in return, is strong enough to protect life on Earth from radiation and from its atmosphere being stripped away, as has happened on Mars. The Earth's oceans are not the only thing that benefits from the Moon's tidal effect. This push-me-pull-me -me effect also works on the Earth's molten innards and generates kinetic energy, which in the process contributes energy back towards the maintenance of the magnetosphere, which protects us all. There are 23 teams competing in the Google Lunar X Prize. Lunar Numbat is a partner to the team White Label Space, who are one of the best organised. They are the only team, as well, with significant Australian presence in them. And this is reflected in them being the only team with an Australian flag in it and the Southern Cross. The lead engineer, Dr. Andrew Barton, is an expat Australian. He had to leave Australia to work in his industry in space science. He worked at the European Space Agency and now works for AOES. He is a very skilled space engineer. White Label Space seeks to attract commercial sponsorship by providing an unbranded lunar mission that corporate entities can pur purchase the rights to have their name on. This works in a similar manner to Formula One racing. And uh, how much has Formula One racing done for society? I suppose it gave us disc brakes, you know. <laughs> We've got turbos now, you know. And Clarkson's got a job. Anyway. <laughs> this may sound unusual, but have a quick look at this graph. It quickly reveals that advertising spending by corporations in red is already rivaling and overtaking National Space Agency funding in blue. The white label space required mission funding is this little sliver here on the right with the arrow pointing to it, just in case. And just for reflection, compare Toyota's marketing budget to the entire funding for the Japanese Space Agency. And the Japanese Space Agency has actually done some very impressive work. Now, why would sponsors want to be spending money on cars that go around a track to enhance their image when they could actually be associated with a successful lunar mission? Along the way, uh, along with Lunar Number, White Label Space also has significant partners like the Tohoku University Space Robotics Laboratory led by Professor Kazuya Yoshida, who's contributed to numerous Japanese space missions, including the Hayabusa asteroid return mission, which landed successfully fairly recently in Woomera. Um, they're working on the rover for us. It's already in quite an advanced state, and it's beautiful. The White Label Space Lunar Mission is well planned, and importantly, achievable, quite achievable. It's been crafted by people who do space science for a living, and the numbers add up. The mission is documented in their mission concept sum summary, which is available to all of you on their website. It's publicly available. So, what's the Lunar Numbat? Well, we're an open source space technology collaboration formed by a group of volunteers in Australia and New Zealand. Our goal is to develop innovative, low cost, open source hardware and software technologies specifically with space science in mind. And we also have an eye to encouraging and advocating space science, especially in Australia. The areas of focused development for Lunar Numbat at the moment are to design and build three components for the White Label Space Lunar Mission. A radar altimeter, 
which will be used to guide the lunar lander as it approaches the surface of the moon. Throttle control avionics, which are used to control the thrust of the lunar lander as it descends to the surface of the moon and provide a soft landing. And also high definition video and still transmission to allow detailed still and video images from the surface of the moon to be received back on Earth over very low bandwidth. Lunar Numbat is cooperating also with the Australian Space Research Institute to provide them with throttle control avionics for their OSROC 2.5 and OSROC Nano uh, launch vehicles, which are in um, a development. Lunar, what Lunar Numbat really is about, and what makes us special, is that the components we're designing are covered by open source licenses, and this makes our work available and modifiable and dependable. Um, for people related in space science work, what that means is they won't have the rug pulled out from under them when they start using it. In practice, this means that not only might white label space and ASRI benefit from the parts we're developing, but also any entity that's in need of them. We're using the methodologies that made the internet what it is today in an attempt to lower the barrier to entry to space science. And in time, we hope this will lead to universities and private entities and space agencies having easier access to space. Space science is a global responsibility. And like other vital endeavours, it requires commitment from government and private entities. Modest funding for an Australian space agency needs to become a line item in the Australian federal budget. Globally, Australia is now the only G20 nation that does not commit to this responsibility after Mexico went and formed a space agency. Space science answers the questions that we should be asking and haven't. The Google Lunar X Prize will help restore innovation to space science. White Label Space is one of the best teams. And Lunar Numbat is assisting by introducing open source space science parts. I'd ask you to join with us. I mean, we've got Facebook sites, Twitter, etc. Interact with us so that we may build the tools to do the science, ask the questions and get the answers that will benefit all people and life on Earth. Thank you.